Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you from the Messy Time Studios, broadcasting as ever from the beaches of the last free state in America, Florida. I am honored and delighted to be joined today in the studios by Gail Zotz, who is a value-based healthcare expert, uh, phenomenal speaker, a lot of fun, real smart. Gail, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks. I'm so excited. I love this topic. Healthcare in America, let's go. Tell me all. <laughs> like Tell me all. I proffered some opinions in my recently published book in the federal budget about where healthcare fits into the melange. And my opinion very quickly was that you know, government screws up everything it touches and the free market has always delivered better quality with lower prices. And for some reason, our idiots in charge have decided to go exactly the other way on healthcare, which is why we are the mess we're in. That's my opinion. Over to you. So, so we got to back up with some of your basics, right? Great. It was great book. Great chapter. Like, I really like the way you broke it down. Um, and I think that when you go further deeper is when you can get some of the things that I felt like you were reaching for, sure. right? Like, like pricing. Let's start there. Let's right. start at pricing. Let's start at pricing. <laughs> start at pricing. Me as a capital markets guy, I believe that millions of free people make you free decisions and get the best price. Okay. So what's the price in healthcare? The, the price should be, like in everything else, what a willing buyer is willing to give to a willing seller. And more importantly, as I touch on in my in my book, if I say to people, if you went to buy a car, would you go to the dealership, pick out a car, drive away, and then 30 days, a third party calls you and tells you what it costs. You would never do that. It's insane. And people do that daily. But go ahead, pricing. Would you sell the car if you didn't know what it cost you? Would I sell the car if I didn't know what it cost me? Yeah. If you didn't know if the sale price was more or less than it cost you to build the car. Oh, yeah. That's a good question. Um. <laughs> Well, I think that, that's, that's an interesting question, not just for cars, but for anything, right? For anything. Like, I, I pay for what I perceive to be the value of what I'm getting. And I actually don't care what it costs to produce, quite frankly, if I want it. To buy it, but to, to sell buy it. it. But to, to sell, sell it, that's it, different. Well, are, are you going to build something and sell it at a loss every time? If I had a brain now, I would, <laughs> I would tend to, as an investor, I would look very very, very uh, uh, dubiously upon okay. anyone that pitched that to me. Guess what? We're going to lose a nickel every time, but we'll make it up in volume. Or we won't know. Or we won't know. We won't know. We, we won't, won't know. know if we're making money or losing money, but we'll make you some really nice pro formas. That's great. And all the okay. executives... How about this? How about packages. this? Would you build the car dealership if you didn't know who was buying it and who was selling it? Now, I, I want you to build the car dealership. Right. You don't know who's buying it, who's selling it, or what they're paying for it, or what it costs you, but you're going to invest in the building. <laughs> I would probably be uh, not really likely to break out my checkbook for that, but that's just me. <laughs> I'm clearly not a government bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's the challenge, right? Yep. You sell this, you build this pen to sell. Yep. You're going to make some money spending the time building the pen. Right. You're so smart. You built a pen. It was a different pen. It was a special white pen. Uh, you all can the pieces... see when you write with it, it's magic. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> okay. All the pieces in this pen, what the sell price was, you say, this is everything it cost me for the items. Yep. Right? This is everything it cost me to put it together. Mm -hmm. This is what it cost me to market it. Mm hmm and that's my cost. Yep. Right? Sure. And, <laughs> then I got you. I'm going to sell, I'm going to make a price above that cost. Yes. I will make enough money to build more pens. Assuming that people will buy the pen for the cost. Assuming that people it. will buy the pens. Right. The, the fundamental challenge when you're talking about pricing is there is no price because it works backwards. In the United States of America, through CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, with input from the um, oh so lovely American Medical Association, they come up with a concept of what I think ahead of time, it's going to cost you in resources to provide a service. So, 
So in hospitals, it's called, and there's 19 different payment systems just for- like 90,000 codes in each one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah. let's just- Which look is why an aspirin costs $98 in your bed in the hospital and okay. costs nine well, cents a week. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I get so excited. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so in the hospital, which is where you hit on in your book, right? You said hospital payments and how high they were. Absolutely correct. It works on what's called a prospective payment system. The prospective payment system says that I, it's in the government, am going to figure out what it costs you in resources to provide a set of services to a kind of patient in a location where you are. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a disinterested government bureaucrat whose paycheck does not rely upon me being right in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> okay. okay. Got so, it. So this is tracking my understanding of, of Leviathan so far. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> so what so what so what the government does is they say there's a base number. It's just a number. It's a unit, $32. Okay. So we're gonna take that unit and we're gonna say how where are you located? If you're in an area that we think doesn't have enough resources, then we're gonna pay you more. If you're in an area where we think it'll cost you less to provide the service, we're gonna pay you less. How this much is coming from Medicare or Medicaid? This is not free market pricing. Just to be this sure is free about. market pricing. Oh, it's even better. Right, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. Government free pricing means communist command and control. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'll shut up. All pricing is based on what the government says they think it's going to cost to provide a set of services for a type of patient. Same question. Do these bureaucrats need to go ask anyone what it actually costs? Or is that just a ridiculous idea that a free market lunatic would have? Who's building it and what did it cost them to build it? No one knows that. Well, someone because knows no it. No one has ever created a free market price, ever. It's 100% based on what the government says it will cost. And then all private pricing is based on that. So okay. for example, there, private pricing- But this doesn't include, I gave this example. This doesn't exclude, I, I, I know some uh, Hispanic Cuban entrepreneurs who have fixed this problem in Miami, right? For example, where they set up, build a storefront, hire doctors, and they sell basically monthly subscription services to okay. the community. Now they know what it costs to the nickel because they're, they're running a business. But they're so, not using the Medicare pricing. They're using, they're charging people what they want to charge them. Yes. So they're saying, but the subscription, let's go with that subscription. I mean, we'll, we're jumping way ahead, but we'll stay where you are. I just want to make sure that for the bulk of what most people experience as healthcare in America happens this way. I'm not going to interrupt you describing. So they, no, they, it's they figure it out. So, right. So, so you have a set of diagnostic DRGs which are diagnostic related groups, okay? And you've got tons of these, hundreds of these pieces that go into it. And it says, right. based on your age, based on your socioeconomic, based on your race, based on your gender, based on where you live, based on your pre-existing conditions, and based on where your hospital is located and what kind of provider is going to provide you care. And how long we think you're gonna need to be in the hospital. A year ahead of time, we're making this decision we and said, pretty soon, if they set up a central bank digital currency in a wallet that you pay for everything with, they will also know whether you voted Democrat or Republican, so they can toggle your pricing based on that. <laughs> oh, that's coming. Well, that sounds a little conspiracy theory. <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. But go on. Go on. Race, age, height, whether you have a beautiful beard or not, all those things don't matter. All Maybe goes like, into okay. it. All goes into it. Not um, your voting record yet. Sure. Go not ahead. yet. Uh, yeah, um, getting there. And so they say, this is what we're going to pay the hospital for for you next year if you go into the hospital in cardiac arrest. Right. And then that's the set of payments. <laughs> but so, You know what? This is exactly how the Fed determines what inflation should be. I'm sensing a pattern in government <laughs> mindsets. Take seven or eight completely unobservable hypothetical unicorn fart imagination ideas and then calculate them in a way that sounds real and tell people the number is actual and keep a straight face on while the reporters are asking questions. Sounds so exactly the same. Here's the 
whole thing. How can you say that you're incentivizing different behavior if nobody knows what they're getting paid? Well, some, I guarantee the guy making six million bucks a year as president of Mount Sinai knows what he's getting paid. He may he not know what any of the rest of it. He may know what his paycheck is. That's it. Right? That's but, all he knows. But, but any like most doctors don't know what they're getting paid anymore. Yeah, like, which is I, insane. And we say we we're gonna like incentivize like you in order to financially incentivize the behaviors we want, which is I'm all for. That's like I love that concept. Yes. Everybody has to know what the costs are. Oh, yeah. no, right. No. So before we do price and transparency and then go one further, which is like you had started to talk about this idea of like pricing transparency. They passed something called the No Surprises Act. I know. And then they okay. ignored it. OK. <laughs> they ignored but it. They just let's went, look, let, OK, let's look at something so crazy. I'll just give you two examples on the No Surprises Act. Yep. OK, the No Surprises Act says that you need to know three days ahead of time what your out of network costs are going to be for a procedure that you may have, okay? Including emergency ambulance services. Three days ahead of time for emergency yes. ambulance. You need to yeah. sign the consent. So I need to know. So is this like minority and you need report? to sign Do a they consent. have half humans floating in, 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 in tubs of future juice? And they look ahead and they say, you're going to need an ambulance in four days. So tomorrow we're going to tell you what it costs. And then for three days, you're in a panic, wondering <laughs> what's going to happen to me. And because you're in a panic, you walk into traffic. Okay. But here's the thing. I, this is like, this is like law. This is not like a theory. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Law is right. But here's the thing. So then the doctor who ordered you to come into the ER because you were bleeding out your leg. Right. Yeah. Blood is shooting out my ears. And he's doctor, like, can you wait three okay. days? Because I need to tell you what the ambulance will be in 72 hours. The doctor <laughs> said, bring them in. <laughs> right. Okay. Who didn't get your signed consent three days ahead of time. No. And the insurance company, the private insurance company says, we're not going to pay for Christopher's ambulance ride because we didn't get a signed consent three days ahead. The only person who then doesn't get paid is the doctor who said, bring him in. <laughs> then they created boards to, to sit and arbitrate between the healthcare payer between and reality the and the law. Wow. How often does reality win? Does the law always win? <laughs> what, what, where would be reality in this? In the this... fact is blood shooting on my ears. <laughs> I need an ambulance now. I can't wait 72 hours to get a quote to agree to or not agree to. What if I don't agree to it? <laughs> the blood's still shooting on my ears as I'm bleeding out. I couldn't out. make well, this I think, up. That, I think that sounds like a lot. Do you, do you have a competitor I can call? <laughs> Wow, that's great. Okay. Fabulous. So, but you are odd to something with your subscription notion. And it is the one thing I have been around the block for a lot of uh, presidents and Congress people for years, right? Here's the one thing both sides of the aisle agree on, which is subscription payment medicine. Okay. It's called value based care under capitation. So it's a capitation model, which is subscription, that says we're going to pay you, hospital, group of doctors, middleman pay provider, um, a set amount of money each month. And now go take care of people. Right. You're going to be responsible that people are like healthy and outcomes are lower, which that responsibility is the difference for Medicare Advantage. This kind of accountability, both sides of the aisle are pushing on in slightly different ways. But but I, I just feel like if both sides of the aisle are pushing on- Let me back up, let me back up. Because they, they get from Congress to take a good idea and screw it up. Nowhere, in, in, and I'm not talking about anything to do with legislation. I think the, the, the government should get out of this entirely. The description I'm talking about is a purely voluntary free market thing, right? I set up a storefront in a working class neighborhood and whether I'm the doctor entrepreneur or whether some you know real estate developer in the community likes the community and wants to provide medical services, I basically am a family doctor 
And instead of you being, since you don't have insurance, maybe you don't have insurance, maybe you don't have you know residency, whatever, you you know pay monthly, 80 bucks a month, whatever, and I will take care of your entire family. You show up, obviously. Right. Test so that extra. kind of concierge subscription will cover your primary care visits. Yeah. Then as soon as the primary care doctor picks up a very expensive pen and writes a prescription, then you would have to pay out of pocket. Or if you went into the hospital, right, and you had said, well, we should have catastrophic for the hospital, but let's just look at dollars and cents, right? Just looking at financially, this wor this is, it's not a panacea, right? There's a lot that has to happen, but the but it is one step, a big step that would make a tremendous difference, which would say um, that you get a flat rate because right now the way it works is it's fee for sickness. It's called fee for service. I call it fee for sickness. And the way it works is this. I'm walking down the street the and, it, and it's messed up on the block. I trip, I fall, I break my arm. I, I go, I take that very expensive ambulance into the hospital. They scan it. They Each thing they do, the scan, the write-up, the prescription, the physical therapy, each one has a different bill like seeing a mechanic, yeah, yeah. right? So if their entire payment is based on this bill of me falling, then they want me to fall because it, it's you're yes. just- Well, they went out and they put the cracks in the sidewalk to begin with. Or they leave it. Is. Or they leave it, right? They just right. leave it. They they right. let, let they let the, they don't fix it because you're financially incentivizing people to want me to fall and be sick and come in because it's the only way they're paid, right? Yeah. So what fee, what value-based care does is it says, look, I'm going to pay you whether you the doctor, you the hospital, you the pay provider, whether or not Gail falls or not. I'm going to pay you the Here's same the amount. Question, but this, this is important. This is important. When you say, mm -hmm. I'm going to pay you, who is I? The government? Well, so, it, so in Medicare, it would be the government, right? right. So- the government is the largest purchaser of healthcare services in the United States of America. Like which no is, question which is, about which is the problem, in my opinion. I, I, I don't know if it's who's where the money's. I mean, because at the end of the day, right, it's like this weird loop of tax dollars that come from it in different avenues. I think can we just table that sort of question? Well, this, of, like, right. this, this strikes the heart of my argument, right? Yeah. Everyone finds money to buy themselves a new iPhone and new Air Jordan sneakers and new TVs and the rest of it. And this idea that someone else is paying, there are four ways to pay for things in the world, right? I spend my own money on myself. I'm careful about value. I shop for the best deal. I spend my money on someone else. If I'm young and in love, I'm blowing lots of money at Tiffany's on a girlfriend, right? right? And I spend someone else's money on myself. That's the young girlfriend who's spending <laughs> her new boyfriend's money at Bergdorf yeah, Goodman. Right, yeah. that's, so that's, you know, that's already, you can see that the, the, the amount of money willing to be spent is slowly widening. And then the last category is I spend somebody else's money on someone else. Who cares? And so that's your third wife. <laughs> exactly. That's the government, right? I So, so... The further you away you get away from the original, I spend my money on myself and I'm careful, the more costs explode. And so ideally, you know, it would be like any other business. You decide that you are eight doctors. You decide to set up a 5,000 square foot mini hospital clinic somewhere because you think it's needed. And you have prices posted at the door, as many walk-in clinics do in Florida. There's no doubt you walk in. This is what it costs for a visit, right? And for all of that, you just pay out of pocket. Everyone pays for that, like you pay for anything else. And as a society, we say, we think there's value in making sure that the weakest and most vulnerable are taken care of. Statistically, half the population has got some horrible thing happen to them once in their lives. And rather than spending all this money on years and years and years of unused insurance premia, we're going to say, once your cost hit X, we just cover that. As a, as a state, we cover that. When you go in for some massive, horrible car crash and your family members are all in comas, so, we pay for that. As a society, of, we believe that makes sense. That's, that's my model. Now, so, 
So you're kind of entering into the Medicaid zone the most on these questions for a bunch of reasons. Um, first of all, you're going to love this statistic. The largest income of every state in the United States of America, the largest income source is not state taxes. It is Medicaid dollars coming from the federal government. The largest income. That. Okay, right. so it's supposed to be a matching one to one, but it's really 70% or more comes from the federal government, but it's an income stream. And so that's, that's a challenge, right? Because if you don't, you, you can't just mess with a state's entire income stream without expect, right? You have to like, you can't do it silently. You, you would have to like, like this is like a- uh, This okay. here, this completely messes with every state's income stream. All federal transfers, gone, gone. So, so gone. we talked about Medicaid, but let's Out. talk about- gone. But the, also with the idea of free, and you know, I actually do have like a, a just if you're looking at it from a financial standpoint, meaning not yes. a moral imperative, which I do believe there is a moral imperative, but it just a financial. Be. Be. But go ahead. What? There are both. I'm. I'm. That's offering what I'm saying. You can both. have both. I'm saying, both. but I'm. I'm about to sound like, in case I sound like I don't care, right? Okay. Is that? Over, where are the big dollars spent? Let's start there. Over half of all of healthcare dollars, and let's let's break this down even more. Healthcare in the United States of America is over 18% of the GDP. We don't stop okay. it. And growing. Now, to give you a comparison, I was just um, interviewing a bunch of, I was in Israel interviewing a bunch of hospitals there. In Israel, it's 7%. Of the GDP, and they have higher outcomes, right? Yep. So, so this is an, an uncom it's an unthinkable number over eighteen percent and growing. Okay, madness. So, where are the big dollars? Fifty percent of all of the healthcare costs in the United States of America are in the last year of life, and many, many, many times people would not don't want all of the expensive interventions that are done, but they're not given a choice, right? Because yep. This is where, like, people talk about patient choice. And you know my story, right? I was like blind electric wheelchair, liquid only nutrition, like, you know, like right through the rigors, 50 surgeries in the heart of the healthcare system, mold dripping down from my ceiling. It was pretty bad. Um, but 50% of the cost is in that last year of life. Yep. You talk about patient choice. Why aren't we giving patients and caregivers the choice? Very few patients and caregivers are given an actual understanding of the expensive procedures that are about to be done and the cost physically of that. You yeah. know, like, like, let me choose. Yep. I can choose, like, at the end of my whole, like, crazy 50 surgeries and everything like that, I was NED, I had no evidence of disease from cancer, and they wanted me to go on um, chemotherapy pills for the rest of my life which they only thought would be five years. This was seven years ago. Um, so so they um, they wanted me to take these pills and I said, no. Yeah. It, it's less than a 2% increase in the possibility that I may not get cancer again within five years. And it's a 100% chance that I'm going to feel nauseous and awful. Yeah, all these after, horrible side effects. Like yeah. finally getting my life back. So yeah. no, thank you. Right. Yeah. So why don't we have those conversations? Why don't we actually involve the patient? Where else are the big costs of care? It's called dual eligibles. Dual eligibles are, Medicaid is based on, it's an entitlement program based on your income, okay? Um, Medicare, everybody gets Medicare just about when you're 65 or over or permanently disabled. Um, so medi a dual eligible is somebody who is both poor and or very sick and or old. Like it's, well, they make up less than 20% of all Medicare beneficiaries are, are, are dual eligible, but they are almost 40% of the cost. Yes. So forget moral imperative. Let's look at what we can do for that population that lowers the total cost of care, improves the outcomes, and improves the 
the experience for the patient. I'd say, right? I'd say a lounge chair with a view of a quiet lake and a, and a self, self morphine pump. Okay. <laughs> All right. What I'm going to vote for <laughs> my turn. But here's the thing you're going to like, lo- you're, you're going to like the story of the G O D C E. You're going to love this. Okay. You're going to like this. See, they, they, they create an impression when they want you to look away. It's like the G of the what? Oh, I'm going to have a vote. Okay. Go I mean, you got a I'm, acronyms, I'm strapped in. I'm ready. Go ahead. Okay. You ready? It's horrible beast. Okay. okay. So DCE is called, was called direct contracting entity. And <laughs> the notion during the Trump administration mm-hmm. was that the ACA under the Obama administration created a payment mechanism. So as the ACA was passing during the Obama-Biden administration. Listeners will know this is Obamacare. You're going to have to hold with me for just a second. But okay. I want to make sure they understand ACA is bit, Obamacare. Go but ahead. you're going to like the end of this. <laughs> doubt it. Go ahead. Okay. So as they're expanding Medicaid, which was Obamacare, and as they're creating um, the ACA is passing through Congress, they realize, right, everything that happens in the government has to come through a funding mechanism. So they realize that they're talking about lowering the cost of care, improving outcomes and improving experience. It's called the AAA, but there's no way to pay for it. How do you do something different and inventive? So in the last ditch, they created something called CMMI, which was the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. CMMI, through waivers, on the Social Security Act, allowed... so bureaucrats are going to innovate. Okay, oh, but I'm telling great. you, this Go. allowed for money to come from CMS, Centers for Medicare Services and Medicaid Services, to go into CMMI, a new agency under CMS, which will be sure to lower costs. A new agency, of course, it will. Go ahead. <laughs> That's it. We just need more departments. Then it'll be cheaper. Okay. Go ahead. You see? So, so, and CMMI could create innovation models. The goal of the innovation models was to create alternative payment models. Is that one of the innovations? <laughs> You're never going to get to the punchline. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm building it up for my audience. I'm, I'm anticipating their <laughs> mental objections so they don't have to go through the effort of having them. Waving with painted breath. What is a GOTCE? Exactly. They've lost track of that long ago. CMMI, CMS, CIA, they've lost. All right. We're getting there. GODCE, we're on the track. We're we're going through the forest to Grandma's house. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, CMMI was created. Obama Biden administration. It was a last-ditch effort to create a funding mechanism. The funding mechanism allowed for alternative payment models that would create new ways of paying through pilots, okay? The pilots would pay hospitals, doctors to accept different kinds of payments with possible different kinds of quality measures. Point or a dozen eggs or like, what do you mean? Okay. Different kinds of payments. Oh my God, okay. So they created, they created 40 different models, 40, four zero. Okay, one for end stage renal, one for like ACO uh, accountable care organizations in rural areas. One like, okay, of the 40, the goal, the goal, the goal was to reduce the total cost of care, improve the outcomes, and improve the patient experience. You with me on that? Of the 40, 38 failed to do that. Okay. <laughs> what are the other two lied? Are you kidding me? Wait, I'm still not there yet. This is this is I'm thrilled. This is a, this is the government I know and love. So go on. I had this particular detail, but it's in keeping with the rest of the clown show. Good. Okay. So, um, so the models, of course, have administration and organization and paperwork. Um, and report, cheaper. And report. more paperwork to make things cheaper. Yeah, I see well, that. It That's has a clear. reporting mechanism for reporting whether or not they're saving money. So they they. <laughs> Yeah. When my business, when we're in trouble, what we do is we add more bureaucrats to count whether we're losing money or not. It always works. Oh so you understand that? Yeah, oh yeah, I got it. Oh yeah, yeah. I need I need more accountants in the back room telling me we're losing money while I pay them. Yeah, I get it. Okay, so along comes the Trump administration. Um, and 
he talks a lot against the ACA from the standpoint of the uh, Medicaid Logic. expansion. Huh? Logic, morality? No, no, no. <laughs> he, he expanded the alternative payment models. I'm sure he that did. That were allowed during the ACA and created what was called direct contracting entities. Direct contracting entities were the first type of model under CMMI, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. You don't understand what these models are. Okay. I provide a service, you pay me money. That's my model. I've got no other model in the world. Right. No, <laughs> no. Okay. no but I'm just, I'm just an idiot majority. banker. What do I know? Instead of using a DOG, a diagnostic re relative grouping of what it may cost you prospectively to pay, we're going to create a capitation that says we're going to pay you a subscription. You can stick with me because I'm, I'm not there yet. We have like a there there. Okay, go ahead. Are we, okay. We're not there yet. We're not a G-O-D-G, -G, God, whatever, go ahead. I'm getting there. You're like, it's taking way too long. No, I get it. This is the keeping with why I wrote this book, which everyone should buy a copy of, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Okay. All right. So direct contracting entities were going to work like your free market notion, which would be, I'm going to create a direct contract that's going to pay me a subscription um, only since I'll directly contract with like Walmart Health or Amazon Health or private payers, but with the government, I'm going to have a direct contract where the government is going to pay me for my Medicare beneficiaries, a flat subscription, which was a percentage of the total cost of care against a risk adjusted benchmark. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> So, is there a category of aneurysm caused by government stupidity? Is that like a, a billing category? We I think I just had one. ICD 10 number. ICD 10, um, by the way, is totally different. That's your diagnosis code. <laughs> We're talking about care codes, which, oh my gosh, at some point I'm going to have category to. Category A. We're going to take all those categories, shove them down one notch. Category one is driven crazy by the government so much he's now sick. <laughs> don't care about the category. Don't care if that expresses itself in heat stroke, heart attack. Don't care. A, category A, driven crazy by the government. How much do we owe him? Infinite. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Direct contract the entities like Amazon can pay me for my government-related stress. I had to fill out an IRS form. I got so angry. I threw a chair against the wall. It bounced back. I got a splinter in my eye. And now I'm going to build the government for it. And here's my question. Did you sign for it three days ahead? He did not, which is a real problem, because now I don't know quite yeah. whom to sue. <laughs> Although if I'd known 74 hours in advance, I was going to look at an IRS form, maybe I would correctly anticipate that some horrible accident would befall me within 90 minutes of starting that process. So maybe there is a self-adjusting <laughs> mechanism there. That's just hell. That's hell on earth. All right, so all the stupidity. So none this, of this is going down to this better this care or lower costs. This, no, none of it did. So... During the Trump administration, they said, we're going to create GEO, which is going to start the movement towards 100% attribution of all patients to an attributed doctor who will be receiving a capitation, which is a subscription. 100% of the country. So the- under Why the can't I just say, I'm a doctor. If you come see me, I will charge you something and you will pay me. What is wrong with that? What, uh, well, what is wrong with it or would it work? I mean, I'm not. It, I mean, it worked for centuries. On, you did hit on one of the big items, which is the um, liability insurance costs. When you when you started look at on, 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 on ambulance chasing doctors who we should switch to Israeli system where you have to post 20 percent of what you want to sue for and you have to pay the opposing side's cost if you lose. <laughs> and you have to sue in the county in which damage is done to you. Right. You can't so go shopping. If you <laughs> look at these and I can show you sometime if you want, like I have all of these infographic like pictures of the flow of all of this money. Um, 
there's a whole category, a multiplier for your insurance premium costs as a physician or hospital. That's how significant it is. So it's madness. It was one of the major reasons, just the size, one of the major reasons I did not go to medical school. I was looking at uh I was I was pre but I could have gone either pre-med or not undergraduate. And in my second uh, second summer after college, um, so you know, be, be, before my junior year. I had to make a decision whether I was going to continue to go down that route, finish up with a degree in biology, and then and you know go to medical school. I spoke to every single physician I or my family knew, right? Coming out of New York, that's probably 30, 35 right. people on Long Island and Manhattan. 100 percent of the doctors I spoke to in 1991 said, what are you out of your mind? Why would you want to do that? If I didn't have kids in college and a mortgage, I'd be gone, right? Like go to Wall Street, every single one of them. And they cited like on January 1st, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I wrote a check for hundred grand to some insurance company because at least one of the pricks whose leg I fixed is going to then sue me later because they were 88 and it didn't go right. Like crazy. But they Crazy also what we have, have physicians spend 20% of their time now on bureaucratic paperwork. Yeah, madness. Like they, they went into medicine to yes. care for people. And I would say what, two of the we're, smartest we're doctors speaking. I worked with, two of the smartest doctors I worked with, you know, uh, uh, they were working on a project, so they're a banker. But they said the biggest mistake American doctors made was when this insurance crap really first reared its head in the 70s. What they should have said is, great i don't care pay me you go fill out your paperwork you get reimbursed from the insurance company but because of the time the thin edge of the wedge the camel's nose under the, under, under the tent right at the time it was really easy it was like oh yeah sure you're with you know blue cross great check fine we'll do that we'll do that for you as customer service they they all said had we known what it was going to blossom into we would have again pushed that back on the patient Great, you've got health insurance. I don't care. Go fill it out. You go deal with it. And that would have been one more pressure on insurance companies to provide a better product because your average soccer mom who's dealing with health bills is going to be like, that's insane. I'm not spending 98 hours a month filling out paperwork for you. Make it simpler. Every additional step we took to divorcing responsibility for payment from the patient led to this blossoming bureaucracy because, again, it's all type four expenditure. You're spending someone else's money on someone else, and it just grows and grows and grows and grows. That's my diagnosis. Thanks, Doc. No, but I mean seriously, I mean I'm, no, I'm saying I that to you because you do this all the time, and you're buried intelligently in the system as it works and thinking how to improve it. And I'm like, I'm going back to the root cause. None of this should have ever happened in the first place. Oh, None so, of this madness should ever have occurred. The root cause if there's no price. Right, which there used to be a price. Cost if there's no price. But there used to and be a price. It was very easy. I'm a doctor telling you this is what it costs to visit my office. If you like my service and think that's worth it, you come to my office. If you don't, you go to someone else, right? And the Park Avenue physician with the cachet and the high rent, if you want to pay him or her $9,000 a visit, you go right ahead. If you'd rather go out to Queens and pay 150 bucks, you do that, right? None of that required the government. None of that required an insurance company. That's a free market price. And what I cost me to deliver my service, that's my problem, right? Doesn't matter to you if I'm making a penny on your visit or I'm making 99% on your visit. If you're happy with the service, no, no, that's how the rest of the world works. Why, why can't we just do that in medicine? Right. Well, right. I, look, if if me, if medicine could move to the way the rest of the world works, I mean, and I and I think that that's some of the pushes, right? The this whole like GODC just to get to the punchline when the administration changed, um, the Progressive Party lost a bunch of things that they wanted during the Infrastructure Act, and somebody came to them and said, "Oh, that DCE." It's a Trump administration program to privatize Medicare. That was the sentence. And that sentence, along with the fact that the progressives had lost political collateral, so the 
administration gave wanted to give them a gimme, a something to put their teeth into. And the head of the of the committee that oversaw this was Elizabeth Warren, who was um, the head of the progressive group. So what they then did was they paused, they paused the entire thing. And they brought people like, like I had a LOI, a letter of intent that I was, that my company was going to participate in GEO for the, like, we were all in, like, I really believed in this program and believed we could both make money and save lives. And um, so I was brought into a lot of conversations, right? And, and here's what we have. And this is, this is, this is. We have people who don't even know anything about health care who are assigned. I assume right? that's 99% of Congress, Congress who votes on this stuff. Huh? I'd assume that's 99% of Congress that votes on this crap. Yes. Yeah, of course. So that's saying, the problem. That's what I'm saying to you. So here's what happened. So I was called into offices, right? Zoom. It was during like uh, when everything, where I was meet. we were meeting with a staffer who had 20 minutes to understand the entire system of healthcare, how it's paid, and whether or not this was actually a Trump administration attempt to privatize Medicare, or whether this was actually good for the country, right? So it be, it's like a pitch contest. And, and let me let me break in. Yeah. That for those people in Washington who are not familiar with the ways of Washington, that staffer was probably a 26-year-old intern who was spending more time trying to figure out which of the other interns he or she was trying to date at the time, who cares not a whit about this problem. And so the 20 minutes you got is for someone who's barely listening to you while they're looking at their cell phone and answering texts. Is that about right? That is absolutely accurate. And there you go. graduated recently from Columbia Harvard Penn. Terrific. Who just spent all their time marching for free Palestine, and now they're As here in Washington, to learning how the market yeah, works. Working for Comrade Pocahontas, who would like to get first off all genetic testing services banned unless she can rig them. Uh, yeah, uh, it hurts my head. This yeah. is you, you just made the argument for. I hate to pitch my book again, but you, th there's no reason for the government to be involved in healthcare. None, zero. It, it never was before. And everyone just assumes it should be now. It so doesn't I'll, need I'll to be. I'll tell you, I have, I have like 50 page uh, thing of uh, a plan on a book on the U U.S. healthcare, right? The table of contents is like 15 pages. <laughs> because there's like, well, because they have made it, it so well, pointlessly what? complex. It doesn't need to be pointlessly complex. But, you know, my thing is it doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to be so hard, which was the title of one of the guys who wrote one of the many books. Uh, he was at the head of the VA for a while. And I think the title of his book was It Shouldn't Be This Hard to Serve Your Government or Serve Your Country. Right. And it lays out in excruciatingly stupid detail. I put it elsewhere in my book. Like the one thing, the private sector, like if you're put in charge of a company, you're the CEO, the buck stops with you. Right. All decisions, ultimately, whether you have nine employees or 90,000 employees, you are responsible for everything that happens. And the most important thing you do is you choose your lieutenants well, because they're the ones that execute your plan internally while you're busy out, you know, lying to the press. <laughs> um, but so he describes this. He comes from he was hired out of the hospital, the real world with quasi real world because the government, but hospital ran a for-profit hospital. He gets into government. He's got a, a bunch of candidates who are willing to take a pay cut as he has to serve their country and make the veterans administration, the hospital system for the people who fought our wars, make it better, right? So he's already got patriots willing to take a pay cut to help the country. He's not allowed to hire them. He has to go through the government union process and he has to go to a bunch of people and say, here's what I want. He's thinking they're going to send me a bunch of resumes like the real world, and I'm going to put my candidates into, and then I'm going to decide. No, 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 no. Because of government unions, they send him one candidate who has no experience in healthcare, worked for the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, for something, and it was his time for promotion. So he said, no, because that's stupid. And then it took seven, eight weeks for them to come up with another one. So first off, no more government unions. Gone. Gone, 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 gone. Goodbye. Gone. 
and then you get to this problem, right? All of these, all of these layers of costs, they have managed to make people believe this is necessary. None of it's necessary. It is purely bureaucrat job preservation. So I admire your grasp of the system and admire, no, seriously, and admire working within the system, how to improve it. But I just want to take a sword and cut through the whole damn mess of it and just get rid I, of it. I get that. I, get rid I, of it. I, I, I'm just, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. I, Why I mean, not? Why not? If people tell their why congressmen, don't, why don't I think that? Get rid of this. Uh, I don't think that the that there's an appetite for. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot of people making a lot of money in the system the way it is right now. And there are a lot of people who are losing a lot of money because of it. When those people realize it and they finally vote, look, if they don't get involved, they're going to you keep getting what you keep getting, right? The country is $130 trillion in debt. Our children and grandchildren are going to pay for that somehow, whether it's inflation or taxes or crappier service of life. Right now, if you live in Manhattan, part of the reason we left, you live in Manhattan, every dollar you send in New York City income taxes, right? New York City income tax, never mind the state, never mind the federal government. Every dollar that goes right to the city, 27 cents of that shoots right out the door to pay off the pension of someone who already retired. Now, that person signed a contract with, us, with, with, with the government officials. And part of what I argue from the book is you're not allowed to have any more government pensions because it's unfair to the taxpayers. I didn't agree to only getting 78 cents on the dollar from of value for my dollar. That literally means a quarter of the dollar I'm sending is not filling in puddles. It's not putting cops in the street. It's not hiring teachers. It's going to someone who's retired. All of that structure is adding cost to our lives. And for we get sure. rid of it, it'll be you better. You also made a really good point in your book about the underground sewage system in London. I thought that was a really good example um, because not when, you know, you talked about how the, the government spent yeah. a lot of money yeah. to clean and up. And some things are excellent to spend money on. Absolutely. Right. And it, and it re and, and, and I think that you could continue that all the way through, which is that if you look at, instead of looking at healthcare as a service, you look at it from a cost perspective which is that if people are, are, are dying in mass because the sewage system is not working, then you replace the sewage system and you actually save, as you point in your book, yes. you make more money for the yes. society, you save more money. Yes. And there are these um, sewer systems essentially that we can find um, connected to healthcare that um, are, are very good investments for public health that lower the total cost of care and improve patient okay. outcomes. You're a monopolist. That's it for not, for not emphasizing that distinction. Public health and medicine are two different things. And most people don't yes. get that. Public health is, it's really much better if we have all the animal manure and human excrement could be cleaned through a sewer system than each of us burying it in the backyard, right? That's yeah. public health. That right. benefits everyone. Right. Having an appendectomy is medicine. That's so, different. So, so, so I'm a numbers person and you're not necessarily going to like where I'm going to go with this, but <clears throat> oftentimes feeding people can lower the total cost of care of healthcare. Of course. Okay. Or transportation or electricity. And so instead of like people are so afraid of what you call like a free market healthcare. Um, and I'm taking it in a very different direction, which is absolutely still free market healthcare with health policy, which is saying, let's look at all the costs. And this is what other countries do. They say, wait a second, we can't separate out what it costs to feed our indigent population from what it costs to keep them healthy. Because if they're not eating properly, say, then they get sicker and it costs us more. Let's look at the total cost of welfare, of social welfare, of social health in the entire country and figure out what we can do, what it pays to invest in 
as a society that will lower the total cost of care while improving the outcomes of populations. So I can give you examples on this if you'd like, but I see you like thinking. No, so no, I, I'm, I'm, I understand. As a guide to policy suggestions and recommendations to the population, yes. As a top-down control mechanism of how to deal with people individually, I will argue strenuously to the end of my life that that is a terrible idea because it doesn't allow people to make decisions for themselves. And it also, you know, the, the steering government policy is like trying to turn an aircraft carrier in a pond. Like it's impossible. Yeah, so, I use a boat. I use a, a carrier boat. So, yeah, so the, the the my entire pre well, a few very basic premises. One is if if you get to the same result by not spending the dollar, don't spend the dollar, right? A good example I use elsewhere in my book is is this this nonsense around food deserts. Like we've got to provide all this free money to people. You got to be kidding me. That, that there are choices people make, and if people in certain areas decide to buy chips and soda as opposed to fresh produce, well, that's their choice. And if you want to become a fat body and die because you don't eat correctly, even though you've been even though you've been told repeatedly the better way to eat, that's your problem, and it's not our problem to pay for, it, right? So, but let's let's use that as an example. A good example. You are right. Over over. 35% of the lower income population has diabetes yep. that costs a boatload of money to treat. It's yes. one of the most expensive things that we're spending money on. Yep. So as a free market person, if you're spending a dollar every day for somebody to be fat, get diabetes and get insulin, but I can offer you 20 cents a day instead, of spending to like re-divert. I can do it better. Stop telling the USDA to subsidize grain crops from which high fructose corn syrup is derived, which is poured into all these poisons these people eat. Right. Let's start there. Whereas the USDA, because it's too complicated. Notice my word for the 20 cents was to re-divert farming. I mean, but, but that 20 and cents. That money goes to the farmers in the None of it has to be spent, though, because right. if you just said to, and farmers, you cannot get all the crops, the vegetables that are in the food pyramid that you should eat. You should eat more vegetables. USDA, that's too complicated. It's easy to subsidize Kansas red wheat number four or soybeans. They don't provide any subsidies for farmers to grow vegetables and perishable produce. Right. But if you just removed all those layers, stop the subsidies to corn, stop pouring ethanol into everyone's gas tank. Let's go there, too. Right. And you gave them just far lower taxes in general. They would be providing the, the products that people wanted at a better price. And there would be you know, people who still make their choice. You can still make your choice to eat Doritos and Pepsi for dinner. Go right ahead. If you're that dumb, even though the entire nation exists to tell you, don't do that, and you do that, I'm going to start calling that evolution. And I don't know why the rest of the population should pay for those bad choices. I, I think that we agree a lot. I think that the step is that um, I would like to save money really soon and save our country. And um, I think that some of, I think that you're much farther along this path of thing of things that become unlikely to happen. So I think that I'm trying to find places where, meaning I think you're painting a picture of what the country could be if we like yeah. started, which is which. Well, my point is we're in crisis. Like right, all, we are in crisis. All, all the fiddling around the edges for 30 years has not worked. We, I know. If this were a company, this were a corporation. No, the, we, the, would, we would tear it down. We would tear it down because uh, it's no not question, working. No question about it. Not working. No question about it. 
It's not working. It it's not working, it right? We have trillion just counting. looking at healthcare. We spend far more than every other developed country in the world, and we have worse health yes. outcomes than yes. almost every developed country. We have like highest infant mortality, which yes. is just which is just like that's just like ridiculous. It's it, really right? ridiculous. it's like basic health one hundred and one. So we're 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 like an F. We're a fail. The, yeah. the U.S. Is like... on healthcare, on infrastructure, on pretty much everything, on locking people up for no reason. Yeah, yeah, we're the only country that's for-profit prisons. Where it was determined that during the AIDS crisis that it was more financially convenient to let people die than treat them, like that was an actuary we're, number, and right? So, and you get to. As I write about also, Paul Krugman, the gift that keeps on giving. When you when you divorce responsibility for expenditure on health care from the person spending it, you get to the logic of death panels. You get to, you know, I remember one of a child you know, pedi pediatrician I knew in New York years ago, we were having this debate. He's goes like, don't even get me started on Medicare. It's like I take, I will take, you know, um kids in need because it's the right thing to do. Right. But I've got to practice. So, you know, I do take a certain percentage of, of, of it. I just deal with that privately. I don't even put the paperwork in. He's like, this was back in nine. This was back in 98, 97 when I was having this conversation. Medicare paid him per wellness visit for a for a child that needed it. Six dollars. It's like the Happy Meal at McDonald's. I'm offended. I'm a doctor. Right. But when you crunch all the numbers down and here's the pot of money in New York City, New York State has. And here are the number of poor kids. You divide that by this, you get six dollars. That's insane. Why would anyone want to do that? So. So, I, so that's a, and, and, and we could do a whole bunch of shows yeah. on the crisis in and the doctors. We'll, we'll right? gonna have to cut it because because an hour we, I love this conversation. And it, what is it, what is what is critical, really critical is that folks like you who know this system, right? And 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 you are you are looking intelligently to find better outcomes. It's like Milton Friedman wrote. It's like, how is it possible? It's like government's the worst, but I've been dealing with government forever. How is it possible that all of these motivated, talented, well-meaning, educated, moral, patriotic people go to Washington to make it better? And what we get is a disaster, right? And that's the problem I'm suggesting a radical solution to, that changing things a little isn't going to work. Right now, when we talk about arguing about the budget, it's 8% of the federal budget, 8% of $7.7 .7 trillion, of which, by the way, we only get $4, million, $4 trillion in tax revenue every year, every year. Uh, that though they're arguing about the budget, they're arguing about you know whether we're going to get green light bulbs or blue for the holiday tree next year. It's ridiculous. We need to wholesale slash this entire beast down to size. And what's going to happen is, folks like you know are going to get a huge fight from this. I expect it, right? I don't work in the government. No, 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 no. <laughs> but you, but you, but you, but the point is, you are in the private sector. You are advocating for far better outcomes, right? Yeah. And you intelligently, from your experience, suggest that I am Don Quixote tilting at windmills because what I'm suggesting is so out there, it's never going to happen. You may well be right. The Roman Empire collapsed. You may well be right. I don't want to be right. You don't want to be right. So get, get, get start the fight. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It is not going to be easy. I really. I would, it's so, it's so interesting because people, people constantly are like, you know, you haven't done service, like you should like, and I'm like, can you imagine being a government? Like, I don't totally, like, but, but like, the, but if anybody ever said, all right, gal, we're going to give you a few years, yep. burn it down and build burn it back it up. I'd be like, I'm and in and is, I got my pen. <laughs> what I find so fascinating is I deal with the government a lot and with very few exceptions, I deal with smart, 
driven, Smart, motivated right, well people. Intention. I know. And all of the, and many of them are like, God, I wish it were different. And, and my brain just hurts. Like, we can make it different. This does not have to be this way. There does not need to be a Department of Education. Kids learn things arguably better prior to this abomination that was created in 1980, right? We don't need all of these bureaucratic beasts that do nothing but suck the lifeblood out of the country. And HHS and all the all these things, they don't and have to happen. And you do know that HHS is only one of 20 different agencies that pay for health care in the United yes. States. Yes, it's madness. <laughs> it is madness. And so that's why, I mean, I appreciate you taking the time to, to come on. I appreciate you taking the time to read that, that chunk of the book. Uh, and yeah, I know what I'm proposing is completely outrageous, but it's the only thing that will work. We are we are bankrupt. The only reason it is, it is people don't understand. Lord Rothschild had this great line years ago. They say, he's like, it's like very few people understand the true nature of money and none of, none of those have very much of it, right? Um, but most people are, are I, I wrote the book from a very serious standpoint, like lots of really good Americans are working really hard all the time. They don't have time to pay attention to the machinations of Washington. They don't understand why some lobbyist they've never heard of gets paid $1,000 an hour to slip some little piece of crap into a bill that benefits their their company. They don't get why any of that works, why that happens. And I try to give a voice to the voiceless. That's why, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm saying, look, how can you fix anything if you don't understand how it's broken? Exactly. And and that's what I'm trying to do. I, I mean, it um, exactly that. So there you have it, folks. Gail gave a ring and endorsement to my plan. <laughs> find out what she thinks is brilliant. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Is there is there a last word you would give to uh, at least for now, at least for now, to 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 my uh, loyal loyal listeners, all seven of them. <laughs> 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 and all the rest who come in occasionally to see what I'm yapping about. <laughs> Just, it doesn't have to be this hard. Doesn't it doesn't have to be this hard. Thank you for that. And that's a perfect summary. And I will end as I always do. Thank you so much. Please, 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 please turn off the mainstream media who are lying to you and tune into Messy Times. Thank you.